Hi everyone, this is Odd Apostrophe. Let's continue our game of the Waihime on PC. Okay, so I've uh, played ahead a little bit, and uh, thankfully the uh, the next sequence, uh, which uh, we took a pause in yesterday, is not as intense as the Caterpillar sequence. Um, so thankfully that's something I... I I think I can share with you without having to uh, edit a section out. Uh, so, let's continue. Though, fair warning, uh, there is subject matter which will be um, discussed, but it won't be in uh, excruciating detail. <laughs> Unlike the caterpillar scene.意識がある時の方が格段に良いからのう。they surrounded me with vulgar smiles. It was that same nightmare again. Yes, this had to be that same nightmare. So long as I hardened my heart, I'd wake from it eventually. The stench of the men's sweat and rotten breath tormented me. Autumn arrived. With it came a modest harvest, and the village finally obtained hope of escaping the famine. By this point, some villagers had even forgotten all about the cursed soot that had rained upon their village. But the mayor and the elders were convinced of the undeniable existence of Roko Kamihiko no Mikoto's curse. They'd only had a single day to prepare for the sacrifice ritual. Because of that, they'd focused on gathering the soot where it lay thickest and had fallen to failed to remove it remove it from several places. These locations underwent visible change. According to ancient writings, it is said that the Akibia vines laughed that first autumn. A village girl who'd gone to the forest in the outskirts of the village to reap for the autumn harvest discovered a clump of Akibia vines. The writings claim that when she reached for the vines, they all laughed at the same time. Furthermore, they went on to say that one of them bit off part of the girl's left earlobe. Yet another writing mentions bats who could speak in human tongues, settling on the mountain. They threw slander at the children playing in the mountains and led them astray with familiar whispers. Late at night, they would come to the village and disrupt the villagers slumber with their voices. These depictions were too fantastical to be anything but figurative. Yet Hinagata believed that literal monsters had truly arisen. The cursed soot robbed one of their spiritual defenses. Simply put, it made them easy targets for evil spirits. It was likely the plants and animals born in the areas where soot remained had been possessed by such spirits and become monsters. Afterwards, the forest they lived in was burned to the ground and all the monsters were exterminated. However, with that, the villagers understood exactly what the soot curse was. They learned that if the sacrifice died and the seals were broken, then the soot would unleash an abomination beyond their wildest dreams on the town. Suzanome withered away day after day, 
There were many days where she never woke up or ate at all. If she starved to death, then the seal would be broken. Thus she had to have a child and pass on the curse before that. At this point, Suzunome was already with child. Nobody cared who the father was. Then winter came, followed by spring. Suzunome gave birth to a baby girl, and immediately afterwards, Suzunome passed away. Almost as though her newborn daughter had absorbed both her curse and her life. Her labor was difficult to the bitter end. Her body was subjected to every sort of agony possible. Upon her death, her face was warped with anguish like a hideous demon's. Her daughter was adorable, the very spitting image of her mother. So much so that her wet nurses doubted she was truly cursed. But once she turned seven, her hauntings began. She lost herself and wasted away, all traces of her former loveliness but a memory. Like her mother, the girl's treatment changed to that befitting of a cursed sacrifice. And once she came of age, the men of the village used her as their plaything. She was impregnated so the curse could be passed on, and as soon as she had her baby, she passed away. Strangely enough, a child was always a girl, and she would always grow up to be the spitting image of Suzunome. Writings by the Kurakami's ancestors suggested that Suzunome, the first sacrifice, was reincarnated into the child of each following generation. If that were indeed the truth, it was a fate far too cruel. She would blossom until she came of age, was violated, and forced to suffer agony unimaginable in labor until she finally birthed her daughter and died. That was her eternal curse. That was the living hell from which she had no escape. Though the ancestors of the Kurakamis did it to protect the village from the cursed, the black arts they resorted to were horrifying. However, once Fate's gears were in motion, they could not be stopped. In order to keep the soot from covering the land, Suzunami and her descendants had to endure an eternal hell of endless suffering. Around the early 17th century or so, the sacrifice's condition suddenly changed. Something about her was clearly wrong compared to all the others depicted in the Kurakami's records. She would grip her swollen stomach as she foamed from the mouth, begging someone to kill her. The hauntings had gone out of control, and there were ominous soot-colored bruises swelling across the girl's abdomen. The two men looked into the tome of black hearts that had been stolen from Suzunome when she was sacrificed. When they did, they hypothesized that the soot had grown with each generation and was now about to reach its limit. If this kept up, the soot would grow too powerful for the sacrifice to bear and would burst out of her. The girl was facing hellish anguish from the swollen soot seeking to explode out of her. The girl desperately sought release from her living hell, but the family had coldly denied her that mercy.
お前も母たちのもとで安らかに暮らせるぞ。Once you have your child, you will be released from your suffering. Those were the words each family had said to each sacrifice every generation. Of course, they all knew just how agonizing her end would be. こやつとて、こう埋める年まで持たせるのにどれほど苦労したか。下手をすれば、次の子は、こう産む前に死んでしまうやもしれん。そのようなことがあれば、この地に大いなる災いが起こる。それだけは許されぬのだ。The curse wasn't the only thing the Kurakami family had inherited over the centuries. There was also the Black Arts tome taken from Suzunome. In it, the head discovered a certain spell. ここの術でこやつの腹の中の子を増やしてすすを分け薄めるのだ No one knew for what purpose the spell had been originally created. Perhaps those who had devised the soot sealing ritual had foreseen an outcome like this and thus came up with a countermeasure. This spell made a mockery of life, and yet the head didn't hesitate to use it. He waited until the girl reached her final month of pregnancy. Then he placed her on an altar surrounded by eerie candles. Once he was ready, he recited the ancient cursed words. <laughs> the girl's swollen stomach distorted from the inside like a bubbling cauldron. Almost like a monster were trying to eat its way out of her. The unfettered pain was too much for the girl to bear. And she finally passed out, foaming at the mouth. The family had continued reciting the cursed words. At that moment, there was a splash of blood, followed by the cries of babies. The heads of several babies burst out of their mother's abdomen. Suffering from agony untold in any era, the girl convulsed and passed away. <laughs> The eternal hell would never end. She would be kept alive in it until the end of time. All in order to keep the curse sealed. But she accepted her fate, for her eternal suffering meant preventing a calamity. She believed by doing so she was protecting the happiness of many. k 
黒髪家で火事があってその際に秘術を記した書物は消失したそうよ<笑> Though the curse was sealed it was also the cause of the sacrifices ever growing suffering For some reason Suzumu felt like the loss of that tome had been another form of divine punishment albeit mild and belated ということはもう5つ後の邪法は使えないということ呪いの進は世代を重ねるごとに増え続けるつまりやがてもう一度破綻を迎えるということそしてその破綻の時はもう遠くないかもしれないのトイちゃんはお腹の中に大きな石がいくつも転がるような違和感を覚えると言っているそれはまさかおそらくは破綻の兆し5つ後の邪法が失われた以上もう生贄から裾を減らす術は存在しないできることは裾をこれ以上一粒たりとも増やさぬことだけ黒髪家は考えたのひょっとしたら父親から裾を取り込んでいるのではないかそれでいい名付けを察しがいいわねそういうことトイちゃんには相手の持つ進が見えるらしいの I finally understood why Toei was engaged. She had been looking for someone without any soot in order to keep the soot within her from growing. And finally, she found that someone in Sho Kamenuma. The soot within her was already reaching its limit. So she needed a fiance without even a single speck of it. Virtually everyone was born with a speck or two of soot in them. Someone completely free of that was one in a million. She didn't even have the freedom to love who she wanted. She was kept alive only to marry a man she didn't love so she could pass the curse she carried within down to her child. Unable to bask in the joys of adolescence. Sengo Karawa, Jinke Ishkin of Takamari Mori, Kurokamike no Rekida Toshiwa, Kanari Yoshiki Tikinata Ikeni Devanaku, Musumetoshi Atskayo Nata Toetanimo, Semeto Hitonami no Jinsu, Kanji de Morario, Gakoni no Kasete Hayakiriba Hatachu Mukari Maniwa. でもそれで苦しみが終わるわけじゃないまた新しい命に新しい苦しみが始まる。もういいかげん。神様の気持ちを考えるときっと複雑だと思いますだって神様は黒髪さんたちを呪いたかったわけじゃないでもどうやったら許してくれるのか僕には想像もつきません
しまうのでもいくら神様でもトエちゃんをこれ以上苦しめていい理由なんてないと思うわそうねこれは怒りだわ理不尽な呪いでトエちゃんたちを代々苦しめてきた六神彦の御事への私の怒り私だって若い時は霊障ですっごい苦しめられたんだからもう二度とあんなのはごめんよ見つけたいです呪いを解く方法先生には知識があるそして僕には力がある僕も先生とは違った角度からきっとそれを見つける手伝いができると思います I didn't know how, but I believe if I continued training and could pass some sort of threshold, I could obtain my own power. ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっ
最も強く受け継ぐお前がこうして現れるのはまるで運命かのようお前のすすをもらうそしてモテる力のすべてを出し尽くしてこの地に災いをもたらすのだ君が六神様なのかわかるのかムツの末裔よ君が呪いたいほどの辛い思いをしてきたことを僕は否定しない<笑>でもそれは黒髪さんに向けるべきものでもない承知しているこの娘に我も同情を禁じえないだからこそこの最後の時にこの娘の悲願を叶えてやりたいと思うお前に抱かれながらその役割を終えさせてやるのだそれが黒神さんの願いならば僕も叶えたいでも黒神さんは少なくともまだまだそれを望んではいないんだなぜお前にそれがわかる<笑>彼女はそれでも僕を拒絶したんだ I was a descendant of the cursed village of Susada Though minuscule compared to the descendants of the sacrifice, I should have had much more soot in me than the average person. That was why Kurakami had called me corrupted, and why she couldn't afford to be with me. もちろん彼女にはいつだってそれを手放す権利があると思う彼女が強いられた理不尽な運命を彼女はいつだって返上していいでもそれは彼女が決めることでそれを決めるのは僕でもなければ君でもないこの千年さまざまなやからを見てきたがお前はやはり特別だ我が運命の歯車にかみ合うだけの資格がある君にはこの地を呪うにふさわしい正当な権利があるに違いないだけれど彼女の気持ちを無視していい権利なんかないんだ不思議な男よお前は我の千年の悲願の見届け人として使わされた天の使いに違いないどのような運命がお前をここへ導いたかは知らぬが人の子ごときにもはや覆せる運命ではない。I felt a whirlwind. Fallen leaves swirled at her feet, giving her a menacing aura. Next, antlers befitting a deer god slowly sprouted out of her head. I recognized her. This was the image that had come to my mind the whole time I was listening to Miss Hinagata's story. <laughs> せんねんのねむりよりめざめいまこそこのちにわざわいをもたらさんまだだそれはかのじょがきめるすずのめのやくめはすでにおわったおわってないおわらせないそうでなかったらかのじょのせんねんのくるしみとかなしみがなんのい
Though she had been treated like a prisoner, she'd always had one avenue of escape. But she had never chosen death. She could have rejected her food or bit off her tongue. But no matter how hellish her life was, she denied death at every turn. It couldn't have been easy. Over the last thousand years, the temptation of dying, of being released from her suffering, should have come to her countless times. A millennium of nightmares offered many opportunities for that. Perhaps she was resisting the urge to put an end to it all even at this very moment. Her eyes grow a glowed scarlet. At that moment, the countless stalls lining the hall had col collapsed one after another like dominoes. Every cell in my body was overwhelmed by an invisible force. ただ I lowered my hips and readied my fist. My fist was to be dedicated to God. I was faced with the God, and a catastrophe that should be prevented. There was no better time than now. I had trained myself in this fist for as long as I could remember. It was all for this very moment. I hated to admit it, but she was right. I had the desire to resist fate, but that was it. All I had was a flesh and blood fist. It wasn't glowing with some miraculous power that dwelled within. お前に。だが、それでよい。人の子は無駄を思い知ること <laughs> Every drop of sweat and blood during training was all for this. I put everything I'd accumulated over these years into my fist. If it was fated a thousand years ago that I would be here today, then I'd ask fate to endow my fist with a miracle to match. I clenched my fist so hard it almost broke. I 
カット受け取ったぞお前の奉納を。s u s u m u s face warped with agony as he fell on one knee. He had certainly punched the god in the abdomen, but his fist had broken. Blood gushed out of his torn skin. The god's body had been too rigid and cold, like it was made of metal, specifically bronze. Crimson pearls dripped to the ground and scattered at his feet like red flowers. Avare na otoko yo. O mae no sen ne wa. Mo ichido. Muryok sa wa omoi das tame no mono datta to yu no ka. So. Shikato. お前の奉納を受け取ったぞなぜ涙を流すもう泣く必要はないお前たちはこれより添い遂げる我が運命の中で千年ぶりの再会をかみしめ合うがよい She spread her hands and gently wrapped them around Suzumu's head, almost like she was comforting a wailing infant. Suzumu's tears were not of pain, merely anger at his own powerlessness. For all his efforts, he had done nothing to save her, so he lamented his failure. However, those feelings slowly drifted off into the void. In the god's gentle embrace, warm as a blanket, all his regrets melted away. Before long, Suzumu's consciousness faded away as though drifting off to sleep. <laughs> By the time she spread open her hands, Suzumu had vanished into nothingness. Before long, all lingering affection faded from her face. Giving way to an expression truly suitable for a curse. Stony Domoyo, Katsumok Surugayoi, Wareva Rokugamiko no Mikoto no Noroinari Imakoso, Konotiva Mukuivo Kerutoki, Kami no Ikarini Furue Nagara, Hirefsugayoi. Those on the shrine's grounds could see her rising into the sky. The divine curse looked down from on high and sneered malevolently. Black clouds filled the air and blotted out the sky, as though she were willing them to. The townsfolk could only stop and gape in astonishment. They all saw something black falling from the sky. Was it snow? Feathers? No, it was judgment. The asphalt, concrete, tiles, and floors were stained black in the blink of an eye. There was a flash of scarlet, and a moment later, flames taller than skyscrapers erupted forth. Dragons of fire spotted out over town, one after another. The flames licked the streets as though they had a mind of their own, and engulfed them in succession. Swallowed by the hellfire, the townsfolk writhed about as they succumbed to their agony. Yet the cursed flames would not allow them to die until they'd been scorched to charcoal. The townsfolk suffered the fires of hell until they were no longer recognizable as human. The high rise buildings were devoured by fire, one after the next. People scrambled to leap from their windows, though few made it that far. Screams mixed with the howls of the scorching winds, like the roar of the sea. 
the manifestation of the curse listened with a faint smile. But before long, she cast down her eyes and shook her head slightly. Did this disaster wrench her heart too? Even after the sun had set, the flames of the divine curse blazed fiercely as ever. The likes of the children of men were powerless to put it out. All they could do was wait for the wrath of the divine to subside, just like in the days of yore. The two looked down upon that scene from a rift in the clouds. They had no bodies. But they could feel each other's warmth, signaling that they were together. Since they had no bodies, they had no mouths, and therefore could not speak. However, they could exchange feelings. Both of them were happy to be reunited after a thousand years, of course. But the heartbreak they felt at the scene before them far outweighed that. She had fought for a thousand years to keep this hell from breaking loose. And yet this conclusion spat in the face of her struggle. Unable to bask in their joy, the pair could do nothing but silently behold the hell unfolding before them. He was bitter. Suzumu's heart gradually filled with frustration. He hated himself for being too weak to prevent this conclusion that saddened her so. Don't worry about it, she whispered. We finally met again after a thousand years. That's good enough for me. But Suzumu couldn't accept it. No, he didn't want to accept it. He absolutely didn't want to acknowledge this end as her salvation. But their time was up. Their emotions gradually melted into a warm slumber. Farewell, Mitsu, Suzuhara. May we meet again in another life. I can't. There's no way I can accept this. <gasps> Mitsu punched a rock showered by the waterfall. His face was damp with tears and splashes of water. After his exile, Mitsu had tried again to save Suzunome. But the villagers standing guard discovered him and wounded him so badly he'd only barely escaped with his life. And after three days, the curse was sealed into Suzunome's body. With that, merely saving her was pointless. He had to find a way to break the curse sealed within her. Afterwards, he had taken the guise of a traveling monk and traversed the land, looking into spells and hidden arts. But as what he sought to break was a black art, he had been unable to acquire any information at all. The more he investigated, the deeper his desire grew or despair grew. And one day in his travels, he had learned that Suzunome had already passed away. <laughs> もっと、もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。もっと。
Ritu had lunged with his fist in the moment Tsunome was being sealed into the bell. Back then, he merely punched as his emotions had driven him. But the more time passed, the more Mutsu became bitterly aware that he'd lost his only chance. A human fist couldn't possibly br break through a temple bell. However, he had managed to bring about a miracle. Or had he managed to bring about a miracle, he could have saved her. Mitsu wept as he punched the cliff behind the waterfall over and over again. I want a miracle, even if it means sacrificing my own body. Please, grant me a miracle to save her. Just then, Mitsu heard a voice from the heavens. It was a young and composed male voice. Mitsu looked to the heavens, ignoring the waterfall pouring on him, and prostrated himself. あの、強く、a child of man could do nothing against the god's curse. That was why they'd had no choice but to rely on such black arts. But even so... The founding of the Susahara Divine Tribute style dates back a, a millennium. It was said the founder was a traveling monk and a mountain priest. As he was training under a waterfall, he received a divine revelation to dedicate his tempered fist to God. That fist is not for fighting. It is to be dedicated to God. It preaches respecting the laws of honor, revering God and one's ancestors and other spiritual practices. That fist and that mentality was passed on through the generations. And thus six or so centuries passed. Mitsu and Susanomi's names were forgotten, as was the name of the god that was first that fist was dedicated to. But Mitsu's descendants continued devoting themselves to honing their minds and fists. And so another four centuries passed, bringing us to the present. The Suzahara divine tribute style has been passed down to this day. Its current instructor is Gentaru Suzahara. He is its 60th instructor since its founding. His son, Suzumu, has been undergoing intense training since he was a boy, intending to become the 61st instructor. 
If all this is true, that would make this the oldest style of martial arts in Japanese history. The Susahara Divine Tribute style and its thousand-year history have been entrusted to young Suzumu and will likely keep surviving far into the future. Furthermore, every New Year's, you can see it being practiced publicly on the bell of a temple close to the dojo. This New Year's, Suzumu has sworn to become the art's thousand-year successor and punch the bell for the first time. From a local community magazine. Alright, why don't we stop it there? This is Autopostrophe. You've been watching Iwahime on PC. So, uh, that uh, ending uh, with uh, Suzume and Mitsu uh, uh, losing to the Dear God's Curse, uh, that is actually the canon ending. <laughs> to the original uh, Awahime. Um, uh, I believe after that uh, we're playing the expansion, um, which uh, is uh, something I purchased with my uh, copy of the game on Steam. Uh, of course I have mixed feelings about uh, the uh, ending. Uh, I, uh, I don't think I have ever wanted the curse to ever win. Um, but the cruelty of the people of uh, the village and all their descendants upon, you know, the sacrifice. Uh, I, uh, I just really couldn't get on Team Humanity on this one. And in a sense, I'm sort of glad that your God's Curse uh, won out in the end. Uh, and uh, you could see that the Dear God Curse uh, didn't harbor any ill will for, you know, Susahara and uh, and uh, 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 what's her name? Uh, oh, I can't remember. So you know, with the curse being completed, that uh, the curse allowed the uh, the two to uh, finally come together after a thousand years. Mm, a better sweet ending, but also an ending which I think is appropriate. Um, so I like that ending, <laughs> and I know probably most people wouldn't, but uh, it seems uh, appropriate for the kind of story that this was uh, that that was told. Um, but as we go on to the expansion, um, we're going to uh, experience some, possibly some uh, some uh, new storyline, um, and uh, I hope you look forward to it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching. I will see you at the next stream.